Hey, time to lock in. Time to focus. Um, so as I was preparing for tonight, um, I wanted to have a kind of standalone, one-off message just to kind of kick the school year off um, and set the tone for what this year is going to look like. And so I was trying to think of like what is like one word that is going to be our word for the year, our kind of catchphrase, our, our word that's going to stand for everything that we are going to do this year. And the word that I came up with, can anybody guess what it is? Freedom! The word is charge. So, the reason I chose this word is because there are a few different meanings for the word charge, depending on the context, depending on what, where it's being used. Um, there are different meanings for the word charge. So the first, the first kind of meaning for the word charge that I think of is charging like your phone or charging a device, an iPad, a laptop, whatever, charging a battery. So what do you do to charge yourself up? Maybe you're the type of person that you have to eat like a big breakfast before you leave every morning to, to fuel you up, get you ready to go out for the day. Um, if you're an athlete, maybe it's listening to, listening to music that pumps you up before you uh, play whatever sport it is that you do. If you're Carter Kelly, you listen to inspirational speeches screamed at you. Um, whatever it is. Um, you do something to charge yourself up. Personally, I have to admit that my caffeine intake is on the dangerous side of the spectrum. Um, you've probably seen, if you've been around, that you can pretty much always see me with a Red Bull or an energy drink of some kind. Um, because without my energy charge, I feel like I can't accomplish what I need to do. Um, I feel like I'm dragging. I feel like I don't have that extra bit of spark that I need to do what I need to do. And so we all have something that charges us up. Um, whatever it is, whether it's sports or going out in nature or being going off by yourself. Um, point is, we all have something that we're passionate about and gives us life. And God has designed all of us with passions in our hearts, things that fuel us, things that drive us forward. Um, if you love sports, God wired you to love sports. If, God lo if you love art, God wired you to love art. If you love to be around people, and that's what fuels you up, is being surrounded by your friends. If you're an extrovert and you like being surrounded by people, that is the way that God wired you. And see... God wants you to find those things that fuel you, that think, those things that charge you up and bring you that extra bit of life. He wants you to find those, and he wants you to surround yourself with them because that's the life that he has designed for you. In John chapter 10, verse 10, Jesus says, I have come to give you life overflowing. And this is, that's the type of life that Jesus is talking about. He wants to bring you life that's charged up to that higher level, that level of like, Think about whatever the thing is that you love doing the most and how you feel when you're doing that thing. Like, Jesus wants to give you a life that stays at that peak all the time. That's the, the type of life that he offers. It's the life that everyone wishes they had, and it's a life that will never run dry. It's God's desire for you to find uh, the life that he has prepared for you. Find the thing that will reach that point, the thing that really like piques your passions, whatever it is, the thing that um, he has wired you to be like the most passionate about. Find that in your life and surround the, and base your life on that, surround your life on that, um, getting charged up by the way that he has wired you. 
So when we typically think about church, sometimes what, what we think of doesn't match, or the description that we think of doesn't match what Jesus intended and what Jesus started. And sometimes the way we think about church could be equated to, like, it's almost like we're describing a poodle. And you can write that down right now, that church can be like a poodle. Because when I talk, when I talk about a poodle, when I, mention, when I mention a poodle, you picture this fluffy dog with, like, bows in its hair, and it's all manicured and looks all pretty, you know. It's all groomed, and the, the fur is cut just the way it's supposed to be. And it's like this pretty show dog. That's what you think of when you think of a poodle, right? But a poodle, poodles were originally bred as hunting dogs. That was their original, like, purpose, is hunters would take them out, shoot down birds, and the poodles would go collect whatever was, was shot and bring it back. And that, that's what they did. It was a dangerous job. They would wade through, wade through waters. They would fight off other prey or other things that wanted that, that prey that got shot down to bring back the thing that was killed by their owner, by the hunter. And the church can be like a poodle. Like you think of church, you think of the description, and it's this pretty thing that is designed to look all fancy, and it's, it's this soft thing that you come, and it's this, this place where there's nice music, and there's nice people, and it makes you feel good, which is all true, but it's more than that. See, the church was designed to be dangerous. It was designed to be a place that went into the wild and unpredictable places. It was designed to go do the hard work, the dangerous work, to go be a part of this movement that had power behind it. See, in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, Jesus tells the disciples, he says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And so Jesus tells the disciples that when the Holy Spirit comes, you are going to receive this power. And it's a unique word that he uses here for power. In the Greek, this word is dynamis. And when you, when you hear that, dynamis, the cool thing about that is that there's an English word that comes from that. And it's dynamite. The word dynamite in English is derived from this Greek word dynamis that means power. And that is the type of power that the Holy Spirit is going to bring to God's people. When, it, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and it gives you power, the power that it gives you isn't some soft thing, it isn't some weak thing, it is dynamite, it is explosive. It is a powerful change that we are talking about. They weren't just inspired or passionate. They were charged with spiritual dynamite that impacted the world. They were unstoppable. It created this movement that spread so quickly across the world because of the power that the Holy Spirit brought upon them. And that is the same power that the Holy Spirit offers for you. So what does that look like in us. I have a couple of videos here that kind of illustrate what this power would look like. So you start off with this. This bowl represents your, your life, this bowl of water. And as this pepper is added to it, it represents all of the things that come, come at you in life. That there are things that surround you, the chaos of the world, whether your family is going through a tough season of life, your family is struggling financially, your 
your friends turn their back on you, you make a mistake that causes people, that damages relationships in the world around you. Maybe it's not even that to that extent. Maybe you're you tried out for a team and, and didn't make it. You got cut. Or you failed a test that you were confident you were going to pass. Whatever the case, things fill up your life that can start to weigh you down. And without the power of the Holy Spirit, you place yourself in it and nothing happens. Like, you can do your best on your own, but those things don't go anywhere. They continue to fill your life and continue to surround who you are. But when you add the Holy Spirit, this is what happens. That when, when the Holy Spirit comes on you and gives you this dynamic dynamite power, this explosive power, there's nothing that can stand in the way. There's nothing that can fill up your life that can hold you back or, or drown out what God has for you. That It's not just that it can't stick to you, but that it flees from you. It runs away the same way the dish soap hits the water and the pepper flees. That's what the things in our lives do when we have that power on our side. So I don't know about you, but that's the kind of power that I want in my life. I want to be able to make a difference. When I come to the end of my life, I want to be able to look back and say, I did everything that I could to change the world. And the only way to do that is with the power the Holy Spirit brings you. So there are two, two steps that I, ha I want you to focus on when it comes to adding that dynamite power into your life. And the first step is this. Be the difference. First Peter chapter 1, verse 16 says, You shall be holy, for I am holy. See, God commands us to be holy because we represent Him and we carry His name. So... He is holy, so we should be holy because we represent him. So what does it even mean to be holy? Being holy means being different. We are to live holy lives, which means that when you compare our lives to how the world is living, it's supposed to look completely different. That we shouldn't look like the people next to us that don't have a relationship with Jesus. If your life looks like somebody else's that has no relationship with Jesus, then you're doing something wrong because you are called to live a life that looks different. See, the world was in awe of the early church because the disciples of Jesus would love differently than others. The church of Jesus function completely different than any church that they had seen before. What I like to think of is uh, this idea of, the black, of a black swan. Have you ever heard of a black swan? See, for a long time, the world didn't think that they existed. They thought that they were a myth. They, they didn't think that black swans were a real thing. And yet, who has seen one before? So you know that they're real. See, how many black swans does it take to prove that they exist? One. In the same way, the world needs only one church to stand out, to look different, to prove the power of God. So I'm inviting you. I want you to be that church. I want you to be a group that represents that difference, that we can be a church that loves differently, that looks differently, that treats people the way Jesus would treat them, no matter who they are, no matter what they look like, no matter what they think, what they believe. It only takes one. Remember, only Jesus can offer the overflowing life, that charged up life. So if you really want to learn how to be the difference, you have to go to God. 
You have to spend time with him. You have to spend time in relationship with him or you'll never figure out what different looks like. The next step to causing dynamite change in this world is to find your burn. What's happening in this world that sets you specifically on fire? What is the thing in this world that causes you to burn inside because it angers you so much or causes you so much sadness? Like there, is, there are so many things in this world, so many ways that people are impacted, so many ways that people are struggling, that there is something that God has called you to respond to. So what is the thing in your community, in your school, in your home? What is the thing that burns you up, that makes you righteously angry, that you want to respond to? Because we all have something, and if you don't know what it is yet, it will come. It will reveal itself to you. And see, that's why I like this word charge, because that's another meaning of of this word charge, is you think about When you say, like, somebody is charged with this, whether it's in a criminal type way of, like, you are charged with this crime, or or whether it's some other responsibility of, you're charged with taking out the trash. Like, you, this is your responsibility. Or even when you say, like, charge as in with a credit card, like, I'm going to charge it to my card. What you're saying is, I'm taking responsibility for the cost of this item that that word charge in this context carries with it responsibility. There is something that you are responsible for. So find your burn. Find the thing that you are responsible for. Isaiah chapter 61 verse 1 says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound. See, this is what Isaiah is saying. This is what God has called me to do. He has called me to bring good news to the poor, to open up the prisons to those who have been imprisoned. This is my charge. This is what I am called to do. See, for me, believe it or not, one of the things that I have been passionate about in my life is the next generation. Believe it or not. That is why why I became a youth pastor is because I know the impact that the next generation can have on the world. Believe it or not, most businesses, most companies, when they devise their advertising plans, when they come up with marketing on how they're marketing their products, the first group that they have in mind is you. Most businesses build their advertising around teenagers because they know that they're the ones who shape culture and who determine what matters and what's important and who cares about what. That's why in the modern day, most of a a company's marketing budget is put into social media and how they advertise on social media and online because they know that that is where the next generations are. They understand that you all have the ability to shape what comes next, and that's why I have been passionate about the next generation, and that's why I do what I do. Another thing that I am passionate about is breaking out of stereotypical faith. See, I was raised in the church, and so I, I grew up believing that this is what a Christian has to look like, is like the stereotypical Christian that does nothing wrong and is a perfect little angel and only listens to worship music and only does all of these things, goes to church seven days a week and does whatever they can to be involved with church and that they dress a certain way, they act a certain way, and I have learned in my life that that is not true. I have become passionate about helping the next generation in particular find how they can live out their faith, how you can live out your faith in a way that is perfect for you. If you like certain types of music, there's a way to be a Christian and still listen to the music that you like. And you can be a Christian and be covered in tattoos because 
if that's what you like and if that's what brings you joy, there's a way that you can build your faith or make room in your faith for the things that interest you as long as you have a relationship with Jesus and you're honoring God in the things that you do. Obviously, you can't say, I'm passionate about this thing, even though I know it's a sin. Like, that's different. But, like, your, your faith doesn't have to look stereotypical. See, when you love someone or you love a cause, it will burn inside of you. Maybe for you it's bullying, maybe it's racism. Maybe for some of you it's seeing people that can't afford homes or can't afford, can't afford clean water or don't have access to clean water. Whatever your burn is, the Holy Spirit is alive inside of you, and when you find your burn, he wants to push you into action. He wants to equip you into action. So that burn was placed inside of you for a purpose and on purpose. So standing up for what you believe in isn't easy. In fact, in most cases, it's going to cost everything that you are, but the end result is far more beautiful than the pain that you go through in the process. So when the Holy Spirit charges us to change the world, it takes bravery like you've never seen before to face what's in front of you. When the Holy Spirit gives you a God-sized dream and when the Holy Spirit gives you a God-sized mission, it takes God on your side to get through it. And that's what happened with Joshua. Joshua Chapter 1, verses 5 and 6, it says, No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you or forsake you. Be strong and courageous, for you shall cause this people to inherit the land that I swore to their fathers to give them. You see, Joshua is who took over leading the Hebrew people after Moses dies. So Moses frees them from from bondage in Egypt, and then they wander in the desert looking for the promised land, and just before they cross into the promised land, Moses has to go and die. And now the Israelites are freaking out because this is their leader, this was the guy. Like, what are we supposed to do now that the guy that was leading us is dead? And then God raises up Joshua to be the next leader. And he tells him, just as I was with Moses, I will be with you also. I am not going to leave you or forsake you. I will equip you just like I equipped him. Be strong and courageous. So that brings me to my, the third meaning of the word charge. I think of an army standing with a man at the helm And he yells, charge, as they run into battle. Charge can be a war cry. You see, when you look back at verse 6, it says, be strong and courageous. And the Hebrew translation for that phrase, be strong and courageous, is this right here. Rak shazak. Say that. Say it real quick. Rak shazak. And see, this actually, this actually became the war cry of the Israelite army. Whenever they rushed into war, whenever they rushed into battle with another nation, when people threatened them, this was their war cry. As they ran into battle, they would scream, Rock Shazak! It means be strong and courageous because they knew that God would go with them. That we need to have a war cry as we run into what God is calling us into. Because war cries, the whole point of them is to raise up this morale, raise up this bravery in the army. And like I said, what God is calling to you, you into is scary, it's unknown, and it takes bravery. But when you trust in God, he comes through for you. Following up in this story with Joshua, they're crossing into the promised land, and they come to the Jordan River. And if you don't know much about the Jordan River, it runs from the top of a mountain to the lowest point below sea level. 
So this water running down has so much speed because it's running down from so high to such a low point that when you look at this river, the water is rushing and moving so quickly, the current is so strong that you can't just walk across this river. The water is moving so fast that if you were to touch it, you would get swept away. But they need to cross this river to get to the land that God has promised them. And so this is what God says to Joshua, chapter 3, verse 7 and 8, it says, And then the Lord said to Joshua, Today I will begin to exalt you in the eyes of all Israel, so that they may know that I am with you as I was with Moses. Tell the priests who carry the Ark of the Covenant, when you reach the edge of the Jordan's waters, go and stand in the river. So Joshua tells these priests they're carrying the Ark of the Covenant, which is the thing that carries the Ten Commandments, and he says, get to, when you get to the water, just step into it. I know it's scary. I know that that water looks like it's going to sweep you away. But God says he's going to be with you. So just step into the water. Carrying on in verse, verse 15, it says, Now the Jordan is at flood stage all during harvest. Yet as soon as the priests who carried the ark reached the Jordan and their feet touched the water's edge, the water from upstream stopped flowing. It piled up in a heap a great distance away. The priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stopped in the middle of the Jordan and stood on dry ground while all Israel passed by until the whole nation had completed the crossing on dry ground. So what is true for Joshua is also true for you. God has given you the highest quality of life. He has given you a charge. He has given you something worth dying for, a dream worth dying for. And he says, I am going to be with you. Be strong and courageous. Rock Shazak. The question is, do you have the courage to charge into what God has for you? If you have your paper, if you look on the back, there are some lines. And you can write down these three questions. Three questions based on the three meanings of the word charge. Number one, what charges you up? Number two, what are you charged with? And number three, will you charge into what God has for you? See, we need a war cry this year. Just like the Israelite people, just as they were facing things in front of them, just as they came up against opposition, every army that wanted to take them down, they were constantly threatened. They were always coming up against opposition, and this was their war cry. And so for this year, this is going to be our war cry. Rock Shazak. So we're standing on the banks of the Jordan right now. And what's in front of us looks like something that is impossible to cross. And I don't know what that is for you. I don't know what it is that God is calling you to do in your community, in your school, in your home, in your workplace. Wherever you are, God is calling you to face something. And there's going to be opposition. There's going to be pushback. We're standing on the banks of the Jordan right now, and the question that I have is, who are the priests? Who among you are the ones that are going to come up and step into the water, being strong and courageous, being faithful, knowing that God says he's going to go with you? No matter what it looks like is in front of you, no matter what the danger is, whatever the unknown is, do you have the faith and the courage that God will go with you to step into the water, to step into what God has for you. If you are one of those people, I want you to stand up right now. So this next part is either going to make me look stupid or if we do it right, they're going to hear us all the way in Auburn. 
So what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to shout these words at you and you're going to yell them back at me because this is our war cry for the year. Rock, Shazak. Ready? All right. I'm going to yell it at you. You're going to yell it back at me. This is our war cry for the year that we're going to be strong and courageous no matter what comes at us, no matter what God calls us into, that we are going to face this opposition. One, two, three. Rock, Shazak! Rock, Shazak! One more time. I want to hear it one more time. I love it. I love it. Ready? One more time. One, two, three. Rock, Shazak! Rock, Shazak! Let's pray. God, thank you so much for this opportunity to come together as as a group of people that just love you and want to chase after what you're calling us into. God, we pray that you remind us that you have given us this charge, that you have promised us that you will be with us, that you are the same God that stood beside David as he faced a giant. You're the God that was with Peter as he stepped out onto the waves. That there's nothing that is bigger than you. There's nothing that we can't do because you have promised that you will go with us. Remind us to be strong and courageous. God, I pray for this school year. We're excited to see the things that you do this year, the ways that you move. We pray that this community grows closer to one another, grows closer to you, and chases after everything that you have in store for us. God, I pray that you bless this time we spend together in small groups, that our discussions are fruitful, that they bring clarity, and that they bring a closeness with you that we can take with us as we go out for the rest of the week. And it's in your son's name that we pray. Amen.